Hi, I'm Mike Hirschberg, the Executive Director of the Vertical Flight Society. We were founded in 1943 as the American Helicopter Society, but for, but for the past 78 years, our mission has been to support the development of advanced helicopters and VTOL aircraft around the world. We're a nonprofit educational membership society, so if you're working on rotorcraft or other VTOL aircraft, we invite you to join VFS to help advance vertical flight around the world. We're very pleased to partner with the European Helicopter Association in support of this year's European Rotors, VTOL Show, and Safety Conference. We have a full day of sessions at European Rotors in Cologne on Tuesday, November 16th, covering rotorcraft research, safety, advanced rotorcraft technology, and urban air mobility. Another topic that we wanted to address is very important, and that is airspace integration for unmanned aircraft systems, or drones, and urban air mobility, or electric VTOL aircraft. Today, we have assembled an international panel of experts. I'm very pleased to introduce Paramal Koperdecker, or PK, from NASA as a moderator for this important discussion. PK has been working on aerospace, uh, airspace research for 30 years and, and is going to be moderating this session. PK? Well, right, thank you. Great. Mike, uh, very happy to be moderating this panel. And thank you, European Rotors, uh, for the privilege here to support the panel on airspace integration. Uh, European Rotors has done a remarkable job as VFS um, and Mike in pivoting from the helicopters to including EVTO. So it's a really exciting time for the rotor organizations at large to go to see the new future and how we can enable that. So we have a really great panel today that we are very proud of. The, our panelists are Vladimir Fulton, who is Manager of General Aviation and VTOL in the uh, department at EASA. So, so he focuses on the certification aspect. So really important perspective on how to get these vehicles certificated and making sure that they are accepted. He, in the past, he has worked in the standardization of air traffic management systems across Europe. So we are really privileged to have Vladimir Fulton in this panel. So welcome, Vladimir. Our next panelist is Phil Banks, who is at Altitude Angel, and he is head of the ATM at Altitude Angel. Before that, he was manager of RPAS domain and a subject matter expert and solution architect at NATS in UK. So we are very privileged to have Phil as well. And our third panelist is Chris Kusera, who is at One Sky. He has over 20 years of experience in aerospace industry. He leads the UTM solutions package. And before that, he worked for AGI. So Chris and One Sky, Chris is the co-founder of One Sky, and One Sky is offshoot from AGI. So we are really privileged to have these three distinguished panelists who have experience in air traffic management, airspace integration and certification issues, as well as innovations that's happening in the airspace integration area. So what we are gonna to do today is we're gonna have each panelist give presentations of the type of work that engaged in right now, what their priorities are, uh, in terms of airspace integration of unmanned aircraft systems, as well as urban air mobility, what they're currently looking at, what their vision is, and where they are headed in the future. That will be followed by extensive questions for them. And then uh, other outside members can send them emails later on to, to ask more questions or follow up with them as well. So panelists, welcome. Let's start with you, Vladimir. Well, welcome to have you. And, to kick off this uh, panel. Thank you very much, PK, uh, for this, uh, and also to Vertical Flight Society for this great opportunity uh, to discuss what is quite interesting and um, uh, uh, challenging topic. So, I would like to present uh, to you um, a little bit of what we are doing at the ASA and what I have been involved uh, in over the last few months. Uh, I'll be talking about icon security and uh, use space airspace. Uh, to global community, these terms may be uh, suspicious or, or strange, but I will try to explain them a little bit, little bit more in, in my presentation uh, in, in the introduction into the discussion in this panel. 
Uh, next slide, please. So let's start a little bit with a bit of safety data. We are safety agency, so safety is always paramount for our acti activities. We have uh, been uh, concerned with the safety of uh, uh, related to airborne collision risk over the last uh, number of years. And in 2019, we have conducted um, um, a safety survey into the area uh, and uh, the outcomes were very interesting. Uh, as you can see on the on the chart, the number of uh, collisions was stable, but number of fatalities was uh, growing over those 11 years. And we have had uh, around 60 fatalities and 100, uh, 60 fatal accidents and 137 uh, fatalities uh, over those years in EASA member states. When looking at the um, accidents closer we have realized that all of them happen in uncontrolled uh, happen to uncontrolled traffic so not traffic not subject to air traffic services and all were small aircraft and many many were rotorcraft and orbital so uh, we were uh, really uh, interested to to find a solution uh, for for these problems so next slide please we have uh, tried to identify uh, problems and uh, when looking at the problems we came to four problems areas as you can see on the on the screen um, ineffective sharing of traffic information congestions of uncontrolled traffic uh, uh, drones operations and airspace inefficiencies and as as a solution areas we came up with a, a combination of the two uh, eye conspicuity, which I will talk about uh, a little bit later, and airspace design, how airspace is designed and used in Europe. We have uh, uh, many countries, they have a sovereignty of, uh, on airspace and, and design. Uh, the, the airspace design doesn't match necessarily across the borders, so it's a challenge here, and um, we, we are trying to find a solution for it. Ideally, uh, the solution is in, in the combination of the two, but uh, what we have to consider uh, as well is a constant uh, interface with the developments of use space. This was back in 2019. The term of use space was known in Europe, but not many people understood what this means and how it will look like. The regulation was not out there. So, so we, we thought, OK, when we work on this, we have to work in a close co cooperation with our use space colleagues to come up with solutions which will be compatible in the end. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about use space uh, and eye conspicuity. Um, so use space is a term we are using for uh, um, UTM in Europe. And uh, in essence, uh, what you see on the screen is not a definition, it's, it's a, how it should be understood. There is no fixed definition of use space, but uh, it's a, in essence, it's a set of new services and specific procedures designed to support safe, efficient and secure access to airspace for large numbers of drones without the need for airspace segregations for sole use of drones. So, so it's actually a drone integration and uh, we are trying to, to look at the, the innovative and maybe non-aviation even uh, technologies and innovative ways how to, how to make that happen. The A conspicuity, uh, we understand it as an in-flying capability to transmit position and or receive a process and display information about other aircraft, airspace or even weather in real time with objective, and this is important to enhance pilots' situational awareness. So it's a it's inflex capability to enhance pilot situational awareness. In short, what you can see on the picture in the left, it's not weather. This is actually uh, density of uncontrolled traffic in uh, in Europe on one day, and uh, when you see the the red, that's actually uncontrolled airspace. It's not controlled. The controlled airspace is actually the the, the white spots there, in between. Uh, the next slide, please. So uh, we have uh, set up a roadmap for how to uh, improve the situation, uh, and um, in in general, it has two steps. Uh, the first one is to find uh, and, and propose solution for use space airspace, specifically for the new requirement, uh, which is in uh, single European rules of the air, uh, point Sarah 6005 Charlie. This is already existing. It's a regulatory text, and we are developing acceptable means of compliance and guidance material for that. So uh, this requirement requires manned aircraft uh, that are operating in use space airspace as uncontrolled traffic um, to be 
continuously electronically, electronically conspicuous to use space service providers. So, um, and uh, how to do that? It's being now defined and I will be uh, pro uh, uh, sharing some information on that uh, uh, later on in, in my presentation. Uh, then as a step two, later on, we want to build on these solutions, technical means, how to, how to comply with this requirement and address the GA and VTL conspicuity uh, more generally, including with, uh, with uh, including uh, the improvements uh, of uh, existing flight information service as we know it today. So the conventional one provided by the air traffic uh, management. Next slide, please. So what we are proposing is to uh, achieve interoperability uh, for this SERA requirement uh, via uh, ADS-L, or L stands for lights or ads light. And uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, on the slide, it's, uh, we are proposing three means of compliance, three ways how to do, do so. So first of all is, uh, certified ADSBI out, and uh, this is a kind of a no-brainer for us because it's uh, it's already uh, very well suited for for these kind of uh, uh, scenarios, these kind of uh, uh, functions, and uh, many aircraft are already equipped. There is uh, um, existing technology uh, uh, which is certified, and all processes are in place to, to uh, allow installations and use of ADS-B out. So, so uh, that's, a, uh, that's a solution or means uh, of compliance number one. But, you know, as, here we, in Europe, we have a, a quite diverse uh, general aviation um, and quite dense in the, in the central part, as we, uh, certainly. Uh, and these uh, airspace users have not been waiting for regulatory improvements. They came up with their own solutions uh, for this problem. And um, there are many devices like FLAM or, or, or systems like OGN, FANET, uh, Pilot Aware, which are used by uh, general aviation pilots today, which are using SRD 860 uh, band. And SRD uh, stands for Short Range Radio 860, and it's uh, licensed free. Uh, uh, band for allocated in Europe for, for these devices. And there are 50,000 and more airspace users already using this uh, system. So what we want and uh, we, we are working on is uh, we are talking to these uh, manufacturers and developers and we want them to, to uh, adjust their system for the new standard ADSL and uh, 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 by that allow their customers to be uh, electronically conspicuous in new space so basically compliant with the requirement. Uh, it's a challenge uh, but we, there is a strong commitment from the community to, to adapt and uh, we hope to have a new standard uh, available sometime next year. And the third option, third means, means of compliance is mobile telephony and uh, you see the TBC which, which stands for to, to be confirmed. I will explain a little bit more about it. This is uh, indeed a um, uh, technology many are looking at uh, today, uh, especially when it comes to drone operations. And we, we believe this is very affordable uh, to, to many airspace users, especially the new ones, and uh, could be uh, a, a very good um, uh, catalyst for safety improvement for general aviation if, you, if, if possible to be used. So we are looking for use of mobile telephony for the first time ever in aviation in Europe. So this is the first use case we are really proposing use of uh, non-aviation technology uh, clearly in, uh, in, uh, 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 for, for, uh, for airspace. Uh, uh, for airspace requirement. Uh, TBC to be confirmed, uh, there are some open points, you know, Europe uh, and as a member states consist of a number of countries and uh, this is a, not a European Union uh, uh, exclusive competence. There is a lot of uh, exclusive competencies uh, by nations. So we have to ensure that it is proper, proper coordination and proper implementation of the coordination as well. So, so there are some aspect, aspects being now worked on now, right now and we hope this will be com concluded by the end of next year, well before the use space uh, regulation becomes applicable in Europe, uh, which is in January 2023. On the next slide, I have a little bit uh, more information about ADSL. So, uh, uh, when developing this uh, specification, 
or a future standard, we uh, set as an objective to set a minimum, absolute minimum position information standard for making manned aircraft conspicuous in new space. Uh, and uh, we have started with ADSB out standard, and we have taken out, or our experts have taken out every unnecessary piece of information that is not really needed for, for this specific use case. And for example, uh, we have cut out um, uh, barometric altitude as a as not necessary requirement. We are, require, we are relying solely on GNSS as a primary source of information that could be augmented, supported by other, other position sources, and then uh, configuration control, and optionally pilot's input, uh, for example, to indicate emergency status. So um, this is where we came from, and uh, as a um, as a result, ADSB out system is uh, by uh, is deemed to be compatible with ADSL automatically because it, uh, ADSL has been derived, though uh, the parameters and values may not be absolutely identical, but the objective uh, is achieved uh, through ADSB out system certified and uh, also ADSL. So therefore, we talk about AD, uh, compatibility via ADS light. On the next slide, um, there is a, a scope for ADS uh, light. So uh, as you can see uh, in the dashed line area, uh, that's the message generation function, and that's where the ADS light, uh, here this slide has a wrong uh, title, it should be ADS light, not ADS B. Um, and it's a message generation function, as I mentioned earlier, uh, generated based on the GNSS sensor data, pilots info and configuration data. Of course, the trusted uh, message exchange function uh, for transmissions is uh, one of the three means I've mentioned earlier. So ADSB are certified as, as uh, deployed in Europe. Then the next one is uh, SRDA60 uh, band. And uh, the third one is mobile telephony. So, in summary, next slide, please. We propose uh, in step one, uh, 1090 ADSB out, SRDX60 band and mobile telephony for the all good reasons you can see on the screen uh, with a little caveat uh, that mobile telephony needs further coordination and action uh, uh, at European level. So that's what we are proposing. And I think uh, if we are successful, uh, this can really facilitate uh, deployment of use space in uncontrolled airspace or airspace where uncontrolled traffic operates uh, because uh, echo airspace, as we all know, is a mixed airspace of controlled and uncontrolled traffic. So this also will affect echo, echo airspace. And we really hope that um, uh, this could serve as a, as a booster for few space implementations in Europe as of January, 2023. Thank you very much. Over to you, PK. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, one quick question, and then we will move to the next speaker. Is 1090 the only one? Or do you also use the U80 or 980 for the ADSB? Yeah, it's it's uh, the the requirement or, or the the means of compliance will be drafted uh, future proof, but uh, uh, we will refer to only standardized and uh, fully coordinated all Europe solutions. So before U80 could be uh, uh, deemed uh, acceptable. Uh, the nations have to uh, accept UAT solution, uh, and it's not okay. only one or two yeah. or many, but all of them. So it's it's a it's an issue we have in Europe for the time being. I see. Yeah, now that's great. But this is awesome. I mean, I really appreciate the thought that you put together in terms of making sure that it's the aircraft are broadcasting their information, and other aircraft are able to gather that information where the, everybody else is. So this is really crucial for airspace integration. So thank you for that insight, Vlad. So now we are going to move to the next speaker, Phil Bates from Altitude Angel, Head of Air Traffic Management. Hi, thank you very much, um, PK, and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak this afternoon. I just plan to give a little bit of a potted history about uh, who Altitude Angel is, where, where we came from, and uh, pretty much what we're aiming to do tomorrow, where we see use space going or where we see UTM going <coughs> and, and how the unmanned aircraft can be integrated into the airspace. Uh, next slide, please, PK. Oh, next one. Sorry, next slide, PK. Um, OK, so company's seven years old, founded, um, founded back in 2014 by a guy called uh, Richard Parker. 
very, very enthusiastic drone operator and also um, technically minded. He's working for Microsoft. He realized that just flying a drone, flying um, even a small hobbyist drone, um, it's not as easy as you first think. The, the airspace is actually quite complicated. So he, he thought, how on earth can I make this easier? And then he decided to give away a nice self uh, a secure job and thought, right, let, let's start this thing called UTM and, and uh, see if I can develop a sensible system. So from um, 2014, we're now a team of um, team of over 40 people. Um, so it's been growing very, very quickly. And we have a network that's available now in 152 countries. And from that, then, we have about 150,000 flight plans submitted onto our system per month. This may not seem very many in comparison today with manned aircraft, but putting it into context, about four years ago, we were probably seeing only about 50 flight plans coming onto the system. And we must remember, these are voluntary flight plans as well. So what we're trying to do, so just a voluntary flight plan, but what we're trying to do is encourage the right behaviours. If we can get people, drone operators, to actually submit a flight plan, then we can start using that information, disseminating that information, and that will improve aviation safety. So we have four ANSPs using our, our uh, technology today, and um, the whole, whole purpose of our organisation is just for one mission, and that is to unify the airspace. We only have one airspace, and we need to use that, and we need to share it safely. The drone industry we're finding as we've moved through, through the years, there's a definite will to learn about how to integrate drones safely. That's just something that I missed off. We might only have 150,000 flight plans submitted this month, but we have over 10 million, no, sorry, 100 million interactions with our flight plan per month. That's people clicking into a mobile application, web applications, drone safety map, to see what is going on in the airspace, the ground hazards, the air hazards, to make sure they can operate their drones safe. So it is growing rapidly, it is here to stay. But as we said, it must be done in a safe and controlled manner. Next slide, please. So as I've already alluded to, as we know, um, uh, whether you're manned aviation or unmanned aviation, airspace isn't simple. It is a highly complex piece of um, jigsaw, I suppose is the best way to describe it, all these different classifications of airspace. And even those people who are in the know, those people who have been in aviation for a long, long time, if you ask them to read an air navigation order or some other regulatory documents, it actually can be very, very difficult. It can be very, very confusing. And as we're getting more and more drone operators, and an awful lot of them are hobbyists, should we really expect them to understand an air navigation order or all the rules and regulations? Or should we find a methodology that makes it relatively simple for them to understand? And hopefully they'll realise, and, and also a learning tool as well, so they understand how complicated the airspace is. So we basically brought the technology together to ensure that drone pilots, airspace managers, regulators, software developers, have all bring the right appropriate technology to get together and therefore improve the safety of drone operations and therefore get drones integrated safely into the airspace. Our platform, as I said, is available. Um, we use four ANSPs, but we have detailed information from about 40 countries, detailed airspace and ground hazard information, although it is available across 152 different countries. And as I stipulated, safety is the number one priority. We may be a young company. Safety has always been the number one priority in aviation. I can assure you that in UTM and the drone industry, especially with Altitude Angel, it remains so as well. So we've also realised that we can't do this on our own. Um, there's no the, the drone industry needs to work with the current airspace users, with traditional manned aircraft um, industries, in order for us to move forward and use the airspace safely. And this is about integration. This is not about segregation. I've had a number of conversations um, with a number of um, airspace users. And they get a little bit frustrated when they suddenly see yet more airspace closed off or yet more drone operations or drone trials. That quite simply isn't scalable. So we need to make sure the necessary technology is around so we can get that integration, safe integration and not segregation. Next slide, please. So this is where we have, it's a quite complex slide. I apologize if the writing on the left-hand side is a little small. 
But what I'm trying to say, what is UTM then? What are we actually trying to do here? We have lots and lots of data coming in. Down the left-hand side, there's an awful lot of data going in there. From all of that data, we can start to provide services. And this could be geofencing services, places where we allow or don't allow drones to operate. It can provide deconfliction service, strategic and tactical deconfliction. We've got capacity management, route planning and stuff like this. There's no point keeping that to ourselves though. In order for this industry to grow safely and integrate safely, the data must be shared. We bring together the single point of truth and then we share that single point of truth so everybody's working from the same information. So we enable drone pilots to submit a flight plan that goes into the UTM. The UTM can share that with other airspace users. Now they could be uh, helicopters, police helicopters, all sorts, balloons, GA, air, commercial aircraft. That information can also be shared with air traffic controllers as well. So air traffic controllers now have an element of have a, we provide a way for air traffic managers to integrate or correction, communicate with drone operators and unmanned aviation. And as you can see there, there are an awful lot of lines weaving around the page. Well, they're the kind of communication flows that we need to ensure are in place in order for us to move this industry forward and to share the single airspace that we have today. That's next slide, please. That's it, thank you very much. If you do any, have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Aptitude Danger and we'll be very, very pleased to answer anything you have. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your vision and uh, how the Altitude Angel platform works. Uh, just one quick follow-up question before we go to the next speaker. You do integrate with the other um, UTMs providers or USS, US service suppliers through some kind of a standard? Do you use, uh, what standards do you use for uh, interoperability? I don't think there's been one formal standard for that interoperability at the moment. There are obviously there's ASTM and DSS uh, and, and that, that angle there. We've certainly done a lot of work under the SAR uh, research projects. And there's a project called Golf, uh, to, uh, Golf, Golf of Finland project. And that brought three UTM companies together where we had three UTM companies, individual flight plans submitted on the individual UTM platforms. And we demonstrated how that information could be shared in order for everybody to see the same information. So there are lots and lots of uh, activities going out there where we have UTM companies sharing UTM com with data with UTM companies. I don't think it's actually been decided, and I don't think there are any regions of the world at the moment have decided what is the best approach, but there are lots and lots of trials taking place. As I said, Gulf of Finland, we've had an open UTM um, project here in the UK, um, which has took place last year. It's slowly evolving the best way how that should happen. Um, we're just going to say which one which one comes out on top. I really don't know. The key is though the platform you develop, the UTM platform develop, must be flexible enough to cope with many many solutions. And that is the actual key to to all of this. Is that it must be a very very flexible platform in order to move forward. Yeah, indeed. Well said. That uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, that that's good. That's awesome answer. Our next speaker up is Chris Cusera from One Sky. Hey PK, how are you doing? All right. Just making sure you can hear me. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Chris Cusera. I'm with uh, One Sky and in charge of partnerships and a co-founder of the company. Uh, before that, worked with AGI. We have a strong modeling simulation back background, and so. When we saw uh, what you were doing with UTM, we wanted to bring our ana analysis capabilities to UTM. So not just uh, dots on a map, but really looking at performance of systems like communications, navigation, surveillance, and um, the infrastructure that we need to support these new uh, these new aircraft because they're flying in, in, in a new way, in a new regime. regime. If you can uh, pull up my first slide, please. Okay, thanks. So um, at One Sky, our vision is harmonizing our sky. So the idea here is um, really in our name. Uh, One Sky, we started with uh, doing space traffic management, and uh, we really think that uh, the sky should be integrated. Uh, we look at uh, low-level airspace and what's being done with UTM. 
what we're talking about today with UAM and then air traffic management, uh, ETM, which is high, higher level uh, airspace uh, uh, for sort of UTM application and then space and commercial space launch all the way in between. So um, it's one sky and, and we really think that these um, different domains should come together. So that's our, our longer term vision. Our short term goal is UTM and, and trying to advance cooperative traffic management with UTM. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just restating the challenge here, uh, there's a lot of drones that are going to be flying. They're flying in a different airspace uh, regime down at low, low altitudes where we maybe don't have as much infrastructure. Uh, we need new geospatial information. It's much more dynamic. And so the idea is to have UTM that is an ecosystem to bring data together uh, and enhance cooperative traffic management. Uh, next slide. Uh, so stating this in a different way, uh, traffic management is typically done with air traffic management, which is um, it's it's a manual process. Uh, we have controllers, uh, we use voice communications, and if we're going to scale in volume, we have to have uh, more digital means of sharing information, of sharing uh, communications, and um, and that data has to be. Uh, relevant to lower altitudes. So UTM is a digital means of sharing that information and enabling communications. Uh, next slide. Uh, UTM is not one system, it's a system of systems. So we have multiple uh, different stakeholders that are involved in UTM, whether that's a government stakeholder like law enforcement and uh, the US Department of Homeland Security, um, or it could be uh, industry stakeholders that are tying in. Uh, they could be tying in as UTM service suppliers. They could be tying in as supplemental data service suppliers. But they all are providing information to en enhance the safety culture of aviation. Uh, we haven't seen this before. We're evolving on concepts like SWIM, where we have digitized information. Um, this is uh, what I view as the, the next evolution of that concept, where we're doing it in a much more dynamic way and we're involving more people in that process. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a little bit of background uh, on OneSky and who we are. Um, we came from a company called AGI. Uh, it's a 32 year old company that's been developing analytics um, for the aerospace industry. So we, we bring our analytical capability from them. We bring traffic management from uh, another spin out from AGI called ComSpoc, the tra Space Traffic Management Company, a Commercial Space Operations Center. And then another company that was founded by AGI called Cesium, which is a 3D geospatial company. So OneSky brings these three different things together uh, to bring uh, 3D geospatial information and uh, you know existing beyond visual line of sight uh, traffic management with strong analytics into a UTM uh, system. And next slide. Uh, these are some of the programs that we've been working on. Um, so UTM is already out there in the uh, in the world in operations. Um, I guess many people might not know of efforts that have been going on in Switzerland. We've been working in uh, uh, in Switzerland and in Singapore. We've been working in Australia. So lots of different projects going on globally that are testing out those standards that PK mentioned. So. I think uh, the key is if we have standards like what's going on with ASTM, um, it makes it easier to get in, involved in a country with new operators and it saves a lot of time because we don't have to go back and uh, recode interfaces to different databases. When we have standards, we can. Um, there may be a more of a upfront cost, but in the long term, it saves a lot of time and it makes us more efficient and actually safe because we're testing the same interfaces over and over again. Um, next slide. Um, this is showing how we believe uh, UTM sort of evolves over time. The reality is nobody has a mandate for using UTM right now. Um, and so what we're trying to do is uh, sh show that the con ops of UAM, how do we plan to fly UAM? How do we use corridors and air traffic controlled airspace uh, simulate those ve vehicles and, and really just have a conversation. What standards do we need? How do we develop those? 
um, and then make sure that the um, the stakeholders all agree and have some sort of consensus on what we're we're building. Um, and eventually, we're operationalizing that as UTM on the right. But I think you know there's a stair-stepped approach, and and we hope we can uh, provide solutions along the way as as people grow into UTM as an operational system. Uh, next slide. And these are just some of the products that we have that help with that. So for modeling simulation, using um, using our tools for uh, sort of offline and analysis, understanding ComNav surveillance performance, real-time operation, um, where you're actually flying vehicles, and then uh, digital traffic management systems. So that's really how we've taken ASTM and made uh, web service and service-oriented architectures around um, those ASTM standard uh, data sharing capabilities. So that's what we have to offer, and I, I appreciate being here and um, being a part of the discussion. Thank you. Well, that's, that's great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, one quick uh, question uh, that I, the same question that I asked uh, Phil in terms of do you see different standards across the world, or are we homogenizing around basically interoperability across different? service providers? There's certainly um, different approaches. We've adopted the ASTM standard. Um, I think through the Global UTM Association, there's um, there's a large industry base that supports that standard. Uh, I think it is uh, is a growing standard. So we've, we're, we're adding more all the time. Um, if you compare it to something like 3GPP for cellular, you know, we wouldn't have 5G if we didn't start with 2G, right? So um, we're starting somewhere where um, in the existing standard, we're able to talk between UTM service suppliers. So uh, it doesn't become an, a monopoly for one company, but we can have uh, multiple vendors providing service. And in that model, it enhances, um, it enhances um, your ability to uh, compete with industry, provide the best capability, um, bring costs down, be more efficient. And I think that's good for the industry. So. Um, I encourage the use of standards and I hope that um, people see value in the consensus that uh, that, um, that organizations like ASTM have um, spent time on. Um, in another role, PKI serve as the ACJA technical lead. ACJA is the um, aerial connectivity joint activity and it, it's sort of an industry organization sitting between GSMA, which is cellular, and GUTMA, which is the Global UTM Association, where um, our role is to try to make cellular uh, standards more applicable for aerial vehicles. Um, so, and, and that's another um, sort of spin out from GUTMA, uh, where I, I really believe that we have a large footprint to start affecting standards globally. And I think we should start looking around at other standards organizations like um, Open Geospatial Consortium where there's geospatial data that might be useful for aerial, aerial use as well. Um, so yes, yeah, standards are great. And I think we need to, to look in many directions to bring them uh, to our domain. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Now, uh, thank you all for your great presentations. Now we are going to go to question and answer session. Uh, all, if, uh, if I may request all panelists to come on, on uh, live uh, with cameras on. I have been very blessed uh, to have an opportunity to work in the airspace integration for the last 30 years. And my personal passion is making sure the airspace system is ready when the vehicles are ready or vehicle subsystems are ready. Uh, so I really find this uh, profession very exciting, challenging, and very fulfilling. And I think uh, we need more people to join this profession and what message each one of you will give to the young professionals who are looking for career options or looking for uh, ideas to, to join the industry or government jobs? Uh, what is the most fun part of your job and what message would you give it to the people or students that are aspiring to join the, the new careers? So this question for everyone, we will start with Lang. Thank you very much, PK. This is this is a very good question, and I think it's it's a 
it's uh, for me personally it's very uh, inspiring and interesting to work on something which hasn't been explored before and as what, one example i can uh, use is uh, use of mobile te telephony uh, for for aerial applications uh, in a in a kind of certified environment and that's that's what hasn't been explored for uh, before and now we are looking at it uh, with uh, with full consciousness and uh, when it comes to young people i think uh, our young people are very skilled in digital uh, means and aviation is turning digital and and um, uh, also um, uh, it's going to be very uh, uh, different in in couple of years compared to what we have uh, uh, known for many years. It's a kind of revolution uh, in aviation which takes place once in a lifetime and I think it's the right moment for young people to join aeronautics uh, these days because they will be able to observe and live this revolution instead of reading about it in the books. Oh, that's awesome. That You're absolutely right. They will be able to contribute to creating the future of aviation. So thank you for that enthusiasm. Uh, Phil, let's go to you. What what motivates you, and what's the fun part of your job, and what message you will give to others? I have to say, I agree with Vladimir. There, what people need to understand: this is the start. This is the start of something big. So, if you want to come and join a, a, an industry that's at its infancy and is growing really, really quickly, and it will affect everybody's life in the future, um, join the join this industry. It, it's moving so, so fast. It's so exciting. And, and also, you just meet, dare I say, great people. You, you, there are so many people from so many organizations, from so many backgrounds, all coming together to, um, to make this industry happen, to make this industry move forward. And I'll just give an example. Um, so this week I've been in Madrid, but um, before COVID, I was going, I was in Africa as Lake, Lake Kivu Challenge, or you're in Kenya, or you're in Tanzania, then I'll be in somewhere in, in, in Europe. And, and then you go across to America and then you do other bits and pieces in other regions. And before you know it, you're all, you're all aiming for the same objective. But I don't think I could have joined another industry where I've met so many incredible people from so, so many backgrounds. It, it's just a fantastic industry at the moment. And I have to say, I'd recommend anybody to join it. It's fast moving and it's got to keep going. That's great, great Phil. Thank you for your enthusiasm and uh, what you guys have done for for moving the industry forward. Chris, the same question to you. What gets you excited about it? You've been in this field for 20 years. Uh, clearly, it's been fun, and you're now co-founder. So, what what motivates you, and what message would you give to the young um, folks who want to consider career choices? I, well, for me, I started flying when I was young, PK, so I was 16, and so aviation is really like my passion, my lifelong passion. And I feel like I'm um, a student of aviation every day when I go and talk to people and um, hear what they're doing. Everything is just a new experience. So um, I think any young person coming into this community would um, would would just love to learn about all the new technologies that are being built. Um, but one thing that drives me every day uh, from the UTM perspective is the new concepts of cooperative traffic management where, um, you know, if you think about how we've grown from a security based sort of air traffic management system, I mean, we build radars because we want to see bombers that were coming into countries and border surveillance. Um, and then we adopted mode C, you know, to give you altitude in your transponders and see you better on. So it's more sharing all the time. We get to ADSB. And now what we're talking about is you could really use your cell phone as a transponder to send your GPS information in. So as a powered parachute pilot or um, an ultralight, you know, pilot that isn't considered part of aviation and culture right now, you know, an a ATM or ATC, they can be a part of the culture. So that's what really drives me is how do we get everybody to be a part of the safety culture in aerospace today? And it, it's gonna happen through UTM and what you started. So I, and I think that's great. It's really exciting. Thank you for your answer and enthusiasm and dedication since age 16, that's just terrific. Uh, so let's go to now operational aspects of this airspace integration. 
Uh, Vlad, uh, I know you have extensive background in ATM uh, in your prior life. Uh, can you first describe how the helicopter operations work today? And then we are going to talk about how the EV TOS drones will be slightly different than that. But let's start with the baseline of how the helicopter operations work today. Thank you, PK. Uh, I think that is a good word to, to describe a, a helicopter op operation compared to aeroplane operations. And uh, what we see here in Europe, and I, I'm sure it's, it's uh, global, uh, that helicopter operations are versatile. They are very dynamic. Uh, they, uh, the operation, their operational framework is very versatile. It, it, it can change character uh, throughout the day. They can do commercial air transport in the morning and the special operations, special missions in the, in the afternoon and third kind of operations in the night. Uh, in terms of, it's also very dif uh, different in, in terms of destination and trajectories uh, uh, from predictable ones, multi-spot uh, and uh, comp to completely un unpredictable uh, in case of, for example, uh, urgent missions. And then also uh, what we see is a big variety of, uh, of stakeholders uh, in, in uh, Rotocraft, uh, which in Europe, for example, 90% of uh, our operators have less than five Rotocraft in their fleet. So this, this means that it, it's, it's, you have many stakeholders to work with. Um, then uh, this leads to us thinking different way. And we, uh, when we have a problems, uh, safety problems in the rotorcraft, we would really need to solve them where they matter. Uh, so we need to go for a tailored, tailored approach. Uh, we try to, to, to really address only the area where it, where it matters. In terms of airspace integration, you know, uh, they work with pilot in command on board. So a pilot is in charge or pilots are in charge. Uh, in uncontrolled airspace, they take care of uh, urban collisions avoidance, so, so see and avoid typically, and uh, uh, enhanced by by some tools pro probably. Uh, and when they uh, when they go to ATM, they talk to the radio and they are seen on radar. So there is a there is someone to interact uh, with ATM uh, always, and they are using pretty standardized ways uh, of doing that, uh, pretty standardized globally and for quite some time. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, Phil, over to you. Can you describe how the drone operations work today and will work under UTM? Uh, right now, they are under visual line of sight, but with UTM going BV loss, how will they work in the future? Um, so you're absolutely right. So currently today, it's, it's visual line of sight. And uh, for those who don't know, visual line of sight means the drone operator must keep sight of the drone at all times. So therefore they must ensure that that drone isn't causing a hazard to other airspace users or anything along those lines and, and in order to move the drone out of the way of, of manned aircraft. And that's very much what we see today. Um, we Then we start to move into what we call beyond visual line of sight. So we have this activity now where drones, the drone operator can no longer see the drone and therefore we must understand is the drone doing everything as expected and is it causing a hazard to any other airspace users? So that is actually quite a complex, that's quite a big leap. It's quite a big, big jump. And as you say, there's an element called this thing called UTM, uh, use space that is needed to, to help with that big jump. Now, BV loss operations a day, we don't see too many actually taking place. They primarily take place in um, segregated airspace. They're separated out from everything. A lump of airspace is blocked off. Nobody else can operate there unless it's um, known about. And um, therefore the drone, uh, carries out its operation. Of course, that quite simply just isn't scalable at all. But the key to what we have now is what we, as I mentioned earlier on, what we try to do is even under VLOS operations, what we want to do is people to announce their flight. Where are they flying? What are they doing? And by doing that and putting that into a UTM, then we can start disseminate that information. We can start sharing with other people. So, for example, we have FRZs, flight restriction zones around airports. Now, that doesn't mean to say you can't fly there, but what it means to say is that the airport wishes to know about that drone flight or has to give approval for that drone flight to take place. Now, a mechanism, a simple UTM solution, enables that conversation to take place. And of course, 
drone operations around airports, as we know, they cause a lot of problems in the past. You know, there's a, a horrific situation for Gatwick uh, back in 2018, but there are many, many other airports that have had to close down in the past. And UTM is trying to prevent that from happening. So what are you doing? You're, you're trying to get the single point of truth. You can see which drones are, are flying around and the airport can manage them accordingly, a line of communication between the airport and the drone operator. And of course, if there is a drone then, that is flying around or is seen to be flying around and hasn't had that approval, the airport is, uh, doesn't know about it, of course then it's deemed a rogue operation and the appropriate action can take it. So we've got these incremental steps. The it, uh, UTM today is encouraging that line of communication. And if we get that line of communication going, we start to get this, as I said, a single point of truth and it enables and improves aviation safety. That's great. Thank you, Phil, for that uh, very clear answer. So, Chris, over to you. Uh, as you said, that UTM is about cooperative airspace. In addition to that, it's digital, as Vlad mentioned. It's service-oriented architecture. It's management by exception and a possible role for third-party services. So, could you describe what the service-oriented architecture means in this context? And what's the role of U.S. service supplier? and provider of UAM services. So service supplier for drones and service supplier for unmanned aircraft systems, as well as the urban air, mo air mobility operators. Sure, I, uh, the word uh, service comes up a lot, right? So and there, there's lots of different um, uses of the word service. So uh, ser service provider, um, you know, or service supplier or web services, uh, being able to do services and, and code, right? So, um, but let's um, just talk about one thing, which is web services, which is sort of like a black box. It's uh, data comes in an answer comes out and inside of that black box uh, can even use other web services. Um, for us, we, we call it, um, microservices we've built up a set of microservices that could be doing things like uh, delivering um, altitude above terrain at a certain position you know and then you incorporate that into your your black box calculation and that is a service that you can um, then make available so if you wanted to to show uh, maybe where obstacles are along a route of flight you can develop a web service that does that using um, microservices uh, and build a black box in a service-oriented architecture. Um, and that's great because then you can build architectures that are resilient. Um, these web services can be stood up on a uh, cloud like Amazon Web Services, um, and they they are redundant um, once they're on the cloud and they operate uh, with higher performance. So it offers us um, the ability to have a safer environment with that redundancy when we operate in a service-oriented architecture. Um, we also have some um, some other security advantages by doing by doing so, but it's a new approach, I think, you know, to, to aviation. Oh, great, thank you for that, uh, Vlad. Over to you. Based on your response to the question of helicopter operations, can you describe how the VTOS and the drone operator operations are likely to be different or similar as compared with the current helicopter operations? Yes, PK. Uh, that's uh, by by the nature, main unmanned. Uh, it's a main main distinction, but not only that. Uh, in, of course, the uh, drones are managed from the ground by operators. Uh, e EVTOLs are a bit a mix. Uh, there will be an operator initially, but they are primarily designed uh, to be a drone uh, in the future. With current helicopters, you have pilot on, in command on board. That's that's obvious. But there are other differences, as I've mentioned. Um, uh, for example, the range of helicopters is much long, larger or much bigger than uh, than uh, EV tolls and many drone operations. Uh, in terms of drones, these are deemed to be more local uh, operations today. There could be uh, even transcontinental, but uh, we, this is not what we are talking about as a business case of our biggest market today. Uh, for EV tolls, the market is primarily the air taxi. Uh, we don't know if this will materialize and when it will materialize. There is a lot of uh, innovation taking place. Uh, so, so uh, 
these uh, will be accessible uh, accessing places where helicopters or rotocraft uh, traditional rotocraft couldn't go uh, for uh, environmental or noise um, uh, reasons because these new devices are a bit quieter and per perhaps uh, will have uh, um, even uh, different ways of re redundancy in terms of uh, uh, propellers and uh, and uh, the means of uh, st staying a lift. Uh, then uh, when we, we talk uh, airspace integration, uh, I think the uh, as soon as the market of uh, e-vitals and drones go up, and that could be uh, initiated initially by uh, uh, services that are serving people, like uh, HEMS emergencies, uh, search and rescue, or any social uh, services uh, required by the society. As the number of operation grows, uh, there will be definitely need for uh, digital and automated uh, or, or, uh, traffic management. So uh, we couldn't imagine the person being in the loop of all of that uh, uh, decision making. Uh, people will be overseeing the system, of course, but uh, uh, it will need to go digital and, uh, and, and automated in a, in a medium to long term. No, this is just great. But yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so uh you know i'm really excited about the opportunity that uh, urban air mobility advanced air mobility drones are going to bring to the communities i think the aviation can reach to every almost every zip code in the world and serve the communities uh, in some way shape or form by different sizes of uh, vehicles and that requires a different thinking in the uh, airspace operations as you pointed out much more automated so really exciting time and really exciting opportunity to contribute you know, from the new way of thinking and paradigm changing approaches in the airspace integration and airspace uh, traffic management. So let's go to Phil and Phil, based on your experience with Altitude Angel and the number of flights that you have supported in different countries and areas, what can we reflect on in terms of the lessons learned? Can you provide areas where Altitude Angel and other industry members have been involved in the US as well as UM airspace integration and what are the key lessons you may have learned so far that are really exciting? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really interesting question because there's so many angles and aspects of that question. Um, I'm not quite sure which how to answer it because you could look at the regulatory side, of course. And, um, you know, aviation regulation is quite well, um, uh, um, well defined. And, uh, and people know that in manned aviation, this regulation affects this, this and this, and this regulation is that and the other. And, of course, with, with drones and, and unmanned aviation, the way it's developing, especially UAM and AAM, it, it's a completely different mindset. We need to start looking at things slightly differently. Or you can start looking in, in a, answer that question in another, in another way is, lessons learned so far is the number of additional organisations who would like to know about the drone, the UAM, the AAM activity that's taking place. Now, for and I'll just give a quick example, if I may. Over London, uh, working with Nats, the uh, ANSP in the UK, we're looking at how do you operate a drone, how you get an op a drone uh, flying across London. Now, if it was a helicopter or if it was a manned aircraft, there would be one organisation that needs to know about that. And of course, that's Nats. They control the airspace. They want to manage the airspace. But when it's a drone operation, it starts to look slightly different. Or UAM, it starts to look slightly different. And it's partly due to the altitude these things will be operating. Um, but you start to go, okay, NATS need to be informed, so they need to receive a copy of the flight plan. Depending on the area of, of London, you might need to get the security services involved, so, so we need somebody else need to go there. Then certain other areas, there'll be police that will want to get involved, and they'll need to approve it. Then you've got the heliports, so we'll need to see a Bassey heliport, go, hang on, you're flying close to me, we didn't know about that as well. Then you start to get councils will go, well, actually, that may affect our, the people on the ground, and therefore, actually, can we be informed about that, please? Then there's the London Port Authority who's in charge of the river. And as you start to go a little bit further west, you get to Heathrow. And Heathrow, of course, isn't just one simple organisation. You know, there are many, many organisations within the airport itself who wishes to know about that flight. And then, of course, you start going through all of that. You go, well, actually, some people actually need to approve that. Well, some people just need to be informed about it. So who, has, who is the actual overarching authority for that? And then you start to build up all these layers. And you start to get a very, very complex picture. So that UTM system now, you need to start thinking, going, well, actually, how do you set it up to inform all the right people? 
make sure people understand what's going on there or to enable people to understand what's going on there because at the end of the day you've got to win over public perception if these things become a nuisance the general public will push back of having these things flying around so there's a massive balancing act here and we're still sort of finding our way through it but i know lots and lots of projects are taking place and it's really interesting to see how these things develop and how many people actually would be informed or actually get uh, or or think they should be uh, approvers or authorities to approve of these flights. So, as I say, something appears quite simple. Actually, when you start scratching the surface, it gets more and more complex about the way we move forward and integrate these things into the aspects. That's great, great. Thank you for that insight. Uh, Chris, the same question to you. What kind of areas uh, one sky has been involved and what are the lessons learned so far in terms of integration of drones as well as urban air mobility into airspace system? Uh, I think um, from my perspective, what we've learned is how different every country is in, in their approach to aviation. So we have things like ICAO, um, uh, but you know, some countries have CAAs, some have CAAs and ANSPs, um, what data they have, what mandates they have, um, have they in, implemented SWIM? Um, and so in terms of going out and implementing a UTM system, um you need to be flexible and your approach to um utm needs to be flexible as well which kind of goes back to the discussion about service service oriented architectures and building module modular approaches to how we um how we go into a country and develop a solution with partners that may already be developing solutions in this area so we have to adapt we have to be flexible and we have to do things quickly. And I think um, probably to that last point, uh, if we uh, continue to be stagnant and not um, getting to BV loss and not enabling the business models, um, that could severely damage the entire industry. So um, we've seen companies that I never thought would would not be around now, you know, at, as we've moved forward on UTM and that's, that's already done some harm to the industry. So um, I encourage us to move to that sort of 2G, you know, version of UTM. Let's let's get out there. Let's do some BV loss flights. Let's learn from our mistakes and let's start learning. How do we go to 3G? What do we need to do next? But if we don't try, then we're not going to learn anything. We'll keep talking about this and we'll be here next year and and quickly be running out of things to say. So. I encourage people to be flexible, but um, also to get out there and try things and uh, start learning more. Absolutely, experimentation and, and uh, continued push is the way to go. I, I absolutely agree with that. And this will be the last question for everyone. Thank you all for your time. And uh, so, Vlad, we'll start with the last question for you, and then we'll go to Phil and Chris. Uh, how will the U.S. and U.M operations scale in the future without burdening the air traffic management system? I think um, <laughs> what we see uh, here in Europe uh, is uh, this as an opportunity for ATM to uh, innovate, to, to transform uh, to something new and uh, uh, we talk about automated systems, common data sharing. Uh, really, this is more about uh, uh, ATM adapting to the new uh, future, uh, new ways of doing things in the future. And uh, we, we in EASAR would like to accompany uh, both ATM and UTM on this journey. Uh, we, we really cannot imagine that we will do things uh, the same way as we have done them for the last decades. Great, great. Thank you for that answer. Over to you, Phil. How will US UAM operations scale and what will be the industry's role in making sure that they scale? Just building on what Vladimir said there, it's technology is going to be the answer to this. Um, we, we've got to introduce new technology to enable um, safe operations and integrate it into the airspace. So 
as we've already said, we, we don't want segregation. Segregation is not going to work. It, it's not a scalable solution. And also it restricts a load of people from flying in that airspace. And that's, that's not any good. But I think the way we're going to do this in the, in the future is what we call by control by exception. So you, you're not going to have all of these drones flying around and air, air traffic control aren't going to see all of these drones flying around. They will be flight banned. They will be managed, but they'll be controlled by exception. Air traffic control will only need to know about it when things are behaving as expected. So we don't want their situation awareness screens cluttered up by lots and lots of drones and activity taking place. That's just going to be an unsafe situation. We're just going to be distracting the, uh, the, the role of controller from actually controlling the manned aircraft. So as everything's running smoothly, it's all going to be fine, seamless. And as of when a drone isn't conforming, isn't behaving as expected, um, then there'll be an alert and the appropriate um, course of action can be taking place. But we, we certainly, it, it's a really interesting question. I think it's going to be lots and lots of human factors that need to be taken into account because we must make sure that they, we do protect that control or we don't want them overloaded. They do a very, very uh, important role at the moment and we must make sure that remains safe and, and um, keep them well protected from this in the future. All right, same question to you, Chris. How will the US UM operations scale and what will be the industry's uh, potential role? I think, um, PK, I think there's new, um, certainly new automation technologies that are needed. And, and that's what um, previous speakers have talked about. Um, but also as we exhaust the ability of the current infrastructure, the current ATM infrastructure. You know, we want to use as much as possible because it's expensive to build new infrastructure. Um, we'll start relying on things that have been around for a while, like LTE, where it's just a commodity um, that's untapped. And if, I mean, if you think about getting on an airplane, the first thing they tell you to do is turn off your cell phone. So it's very hard for us to think about, well, how could I ever use cellular for drones? Um, most people think it's like, some security issue or it's going to make the plane crash. So um, we need to think about existing infrastructure differently. We need to think about industry provided infrastructure differently. It, it can't just be authoritative um, solutions built by a government. It can be other solutions that provide input to aviation systems. So if we, th if we want to scale, we have to think about different ways to provide the infrastructure to scale. And I think that that if we can do that, then, then we'll move quickly and we'll move much more efficiently because the industry is already there, ready to support. We just have to uh, enable it and we have to approve it, allow it to happen. Great. I absolutely enjoyed uh, talking to you all and thank you for your great insights and experience based uh, sharing and knowledge sharing. So really thrilled to have that opportunity to share uh, and thank you European Rotors and Vertical Flight Society for giving us the opportunity to talk about a very important aspect of uh, integration into airspace of these vehicles. And we look forward to the continued progress towards vertical uh, vehicles uh, beyond just drones and helicopters and EV toys, but many types of other aircraft. Uh, super all the way to supersonic and hypersonic uh, getting integrated into airspace and thank you for that opportunity